I've been a customer of Optimizer for maybe six or seven years now. It's been one of the, the uh, most amazing tools to have for my agency. Uh, and I got the opportunity, uh, Fred Valles, who's the sort of co-founder of Optimizer, he was over in London for the HeroConf that took place last month. And uh, he invited me to a client meeting in London the day after HeroConf finished. And basically he reprised his presentation that he actually delivered. He was one of the keynote speakers at HeroConf. Uh, and I managed to kind of uh, stick, a, stick a microphone on him and record his presentation. And I thought in this video, I would actually share that with you. So hope you enjoy it. And uh, if you have any comments, leave them below. I found the, um, the conversation very enlightening and his feedback and insights into Performance Max and things like that, really, really insightful. So I hope you enjoy it and let me know what you think. Max. Um, the only one that was left for people to grab was the thumbs up. All the thumbs <laughs> down were gone. <laughs> okay. um, so anyway, but uh, <clears throat> but we believe that, I mean, Pmax can be great. It's just uh, you need to know how to control it. And there are actually some controls that are not necessarily well explained, um, just because it's very different from how things used to be. And we'll, we'll go over that today. Okay, but so in terms of the, the state of PPC, um, the writing has been on the wall for a long time that Performance Max is sort of the, the way forward. Lots more automation, a lot less um, seeming control. It was uh, Sridhar Ramaswamy, who was the SVP of Google Ads uh, about four or five years ago at GML. He got up on stage and basically said, uh, Google Ads needs to be advertising that works for everyone. And that really just meant that it needed to be simplified. So it's not just for experts like us, but that any average advertiser could get good results. Um, and then Sundar Pichai, of course, uh, CEO says Google's an AI first company. So you put two and two together and you sort of get performance max as a fairly logical outcome of those uh, sentiments from the Google executives. Um, <clears throat> this is also a state of the industry, right? So one of the things that I have been wrong about in, in my first book, I think I talked a lot more about humans can bring a lot of creativity that machines cannot. Uh, I've been proven wrong in that regard. I think humans can still do creative things, machines cannot, but machines are actually pretty amazing at this point. Um, and so we've all seen OpenAI, a San Francisco-based company that has, uh, in this case, it's Wally, is their image generation system. And these images are generated by computer in about 45 seconds, just by typing in a phrase of what it is you'd like to see. Uh, this is not image search, this is actually what the computer generated. So I really like the one where you say, show me what Muppets would look like if they were in a Mad Max movie. Um, and it comes up with a great creative element. But I think it's also particularly interesting when you look at Google GML and how they show much more visual search results and ad results. Um, and so as PPC specialists, we've you know, become so accustomed to text and not doing a lot of image work. And so that kind of scares us when Google says, oh, we need more images. and it's just a really big shift in the work that we do, but if we have systems like this, it can really help us. Uh, and by the way, if you want to play with this, Optimizer uh, is integrating the OpenAI systems. So when it comes to ad text generation, we will now start suggesting to you ad text um, from these artificial intelligence machine learning systems. Um, and this is also interesting because Google's starting to do the same thing, but they have a different machine learning model for it. So now you can get suggestions from Optimizer on the one side, Google on the other side, and you could even compete those against each other and uh, then let the statistics tell you the real story. I also wanted to uh, talk about the economy, right? So everybody's worried about inflation and <clears throat> the, you know, are we going to have to lay people off? Are we going to not be in an industry that's a good one to be in anymore? But, but the story is really, it's a slowing of growth. It's not a decline. So even if you look at Google, and Google's announcing results on the 26th, so in about six days. So then we'll know about the forecast right now is about a 12% year over year growth, which is still a growing industry. Um, it's still hundreds of billions of dollars. So I'm personally not too worried about the industry. I also think as agencies, hopefully you have a diversified client base. And if you see travel declining, maybe there's an uptick in some of the other clients that you have and vice versa. So hopefully uh, that balance will help everyone. Uh, the one thing that is worrisome though, is that the last economic crisis we had a little over 10 years ago, digital was about 12% of ad spend. Now it's two thirds of ad spend. So if there is an impact, it's obviously impacting a lot more people. 
um, and a lot more of the business that we now handle, right? So the, the overall numbers could be much more significant. And then the uh, the other thing that just keeps going is Google Ads is obviously constantly evolving. It's not just stuff like Pmax. Um, but one interesting tidbit that they shared at GML, uh, I don't know if you picked up on it when you watched it, but they said that TensorFlow, the, uh, the systems that run smart bidding, had improved 10x in the last year. Um, and usually when we think about acceleration in machine learning, it's more on the Moore's Law schedule. And Moore's Law is basically every 18 months to 24 months, machine uh, computing power doubles. And so that's how you get the exponential growth. But now to see that in a year, Google 10 x the performance of that, like that's a, a huge leap forward. And that kind of explains why we're seeing pretty decent results when it comes to automated bidding. Um, and it just makes sense to use automated bidding. But uh, yeah, where does that leave us in terms of the, the industry? So, you know, both of you have been doing PPC for a long time. So the types of things we used to, I mean, you talk, told us about one and a half million keywords, like that level of detail and a bid for every keyword and a bid adjustment for every campaign or even ad group and extensions for everything and different ads for everything. I mean, these were thousands of details we used to manage all for the sake of ultimately just getting conversions. And so now the big shift is, of course, that Google is automating that level of detail and we don't have to do it anymore, um, right? But then what does that mean for us as humans? Well, luckily, um, the value that we bring, according to Boston Consulting Group, is around 15%. So they, they made this study and they said that if you bring advanced automations into play, you'll get 20% better results. Um, that's great. But if you add humans on top of that advanced automation, you get another 15% boost. And uh, you know, when I was at the conference, Dan Gilbert, who's the, the founder of Brain Labs, he was basically telling people, you know, you shouldn't be doing PPC. It's not a high value add business. It's not something you're going to make money in or be successful in a career. <clears throat> I mean, when you see 15% value add in a hundred plus billion dollar industry, eh, that's still a lot of money, right? So I think we we're still going to be able to bring something to the table here. Um, but to bring something interesting to the table, we have to figure out how we shift what it is we actually do. And so if you think of Google having put a, uh, a wall around managing things that we used to manage, and Pmax is a great example. You can't manage a lot of the details you used to. Uh, you also don't get insights about those details. But if that wall exists, how do we manage at the periphery of that system? And so three examples, um, and I'm going to cover each of these with a look at how Optimizer can help you. But the first is your optimization of structured data. So when we talk about ads, it's no longer a fully qualified ad, it's the components of the ad. And that's really, that's feeds, right? So it's what is a feed of your value propositions and your headlines, and et cetera. Um, and then second, what about setting targets from business goals? So uh, everybody loves to talk about T-ROAS, but what's the right T-ROAS? And is, is T-ROAS a static thing? I argue that it is certainly not. It's just one level up in the chain, but something that you still need to manage to your business goals. Um, and that's not necessarily easy. And then the third is about optimizing conversion data. So if we're gonna have all these machines that are trying to do what we want it to do, well, we better tell them what it is we actually want. Um, if we only partially tell them, they're gonna start making mistakes and not actually drive the value that we hope. So these are three examples of the value we can add. Now, um, Jim, I know you've read the books, but the sort of the, the, the story of what a PPC marketer looks like in the age of automation is there's three equivalents to human roles. Um, and I don't, I don't know, uh, Bart, have you, have you read the doctor pilot? No? Okay, so I'll go through the analogy. So um, <clears throat> think of yourself as the PPC pilot. So it's an oversight role, it's a monitoring role. Um, you can also think of yourself as a, a doctor for PPC. Doctors tend to uh, prescribe solutions because they have a holistic view of the patient and they sort of know how the different medications may interact, how different medications may be more applicable to certain types of patients and conditions. Um, so that's also, you can think of PPCs specialists as figuring out what does the client want from us? What's the background of this client? So which of the nine different bidding strategies that Google offers is the right one for this client? Right. It'd be kind of cool if there was one thing that said automate bidding, but no, it's, you have to choose from a whole variety of things and then each one has settings. Uh, and by the way, if you go on to automated bidding, but you don't have a good attribution model, you're probably going to break your campaign. Uh, so you're the PPC doctor who knows how to prevent 
these kinds of disasters. And then you also play the role of teacher. So uh, we talk about machine learning. And obviously when you talk about learning, you have to have a teacher to teach that system to do the right thing. Um, and so you have to teach it what you actually want to get out of it. But then when you go deeper on the pilot role, um, the pilot is really about monitoring, right? So pilots have avionics to look at making sure that the machine is flying at the right altitude, that it's going the right speed. Um, same thing in PPC. An example I've given before, maybe some of you have heard it, but um, there was this one client, uh, they, they asked me to consult on something and they were basically saying, well, we, we sell these customized t-shirts and all of a sudden, like our volume has dropped tremendously and they couldn't figure out why. And they were running automated bidding. And so we looked and we saw that for a while their uh, team had redone the landing pages and the landing pages just had horrendous conversion rate. Um, and this was a website team decision. So, but horrendous conversion rates, smart bidding, automated bidding looks at this and says, well, we should just bid lower because your conversion rate has gone down. Now the web team quickly picked up on the fact that the whole business was suffering. So they fixed, they went back to the old landing page design and the conversion rates came back, but the bidding system had already bid stuff down so far that it was now on page two and it never got fresh data at a good enough volume to say, hey, we should actually start restoring these bids to the old levels. Um, so as a PPC pilot, if you had seen that, you would have said, well, the problem is not with bids, the problem is with the landing page. And once we figure out that that's fixed, we should do a data exclusion to not look at that data in the machine learning algorithms and to let it bid again at the levels that it was before. Um, right? So you have to keep your eyes on the internal systems. But then you also, as a PPC pilot, you have to be much more involved in the business. As a PPC expert, you just have to know your business better. Um, and so when it comes to external factors, right now the weather is very pertinent, but London being so hot um, and bidding by weather is something we've talked about for years and years. But now with the economic situation, it's much more interesting to think about uh, how do people behave when there's recession, inflation, all of these types of things. Um, and I found this really interesting. I, re I read a, an article and it was about this research that had been done by economists and they correlated um, that people are much more impacted by gasoline prices than CPI, consumer price index. And, and their point was, and it kind of makes sense when you think about it, but if you go to the grocery store and your eggs are 30% more expensive, well, so they cost $4 instead of $3. Okay, maybe you notice, but you probably don't. It's not a big thing. And uh, But you go to the gas station once a week, once every other week to fill up your car, and now we're talking about 100 pounds has all of a sudden become 200 pounds or your uh, your heating bill has gone up dramatically, right? These are the big hits. And, and the heating bill actually maybe not that big a deal because you don't pay it as often or it may be on auto pay, but you go to the pump, you actually put in your card, you see the numbers running. Um, and so maybe we should connect our PPC accounts uh, or we should find correlations between how much does gas cost and how many uh, sneakers is Adidas selling, right? If I'm paying double for gas, maybe I'm not buying as many sneakers as I was before. Uh, I'm guilty of buying a lot of sneakers, way too many. So that's my favorite example. Um, but this is, I mean, just on the point of yeah. the, um, the weather, I mean, the, the one that always makes me uh, aware of it is when you go to Las Vegas, right? So normally when you go across the bridge over the strip, mm -hmm. right, there's always people sitting there with a big esky full of cold water, right? And then all of a sudden it starts raining and lo and behold, those guys, are, they get rid of the water and they're selling umbrellas. Right, because they realize that there's yeah. been a change in the weather that's brought about a change in consumer behavior. Uh -huh. Right, And it's it's just trying to understand that. How, how did they know that they were going to be selling umbrellas? Because obviously they checked the weather, mm -hmm. made sure that they had the, the kind of stock available to do that. Yeah. Right, and, and again, they would sell lots of umbrellas when ordinarily would not normally be selling water. Yeah, that's a brilliant example. Yeah, um, exactly. So you look at those external factors and, and then for PPC specialists, where we operate at uh, the scale where we can't see the weather happening, it's more like how do you have an, uh, a data feed from the weather or a data feed from consumer price indexes and, uh, and bring that into the campaigns. Um, the other thing is be careful about tunnel vision. So if you as the PPC pilot have been given a mission to, uh, to sell more things, you may be looking at this <coughs> runway and like, I'm going to land this plane. Like I know exactly what I'm doing, but why is there an elephant next to the runway? And, and is that elephant going to step into my path on the runway? And that elephant for us in PPC, depending on what vertical you're in, e-commerce, I mean, we, we talk about supply chain issues, we talk about inflation. Uh, when you talk about B2B and SaaS, uh, I don't know if you've seen this research from Microsoft, 
it's about the workday consumer. Um, and this is, this is going to blow your minds. But the, what they found is that people, when they have a computer from work, wait for it, this is really going to blow your minds. But people use those computers to do personal things. Whoa, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's a whole piece of research on that. And, uh, and this is something that I think we all understood. Now they've quantified it a little bit. And then that, that's a huge deal, right? And then figuring out how do you redo your campaigns based on this? And, and you might have been IP targeting or IP excluding based on work. Uh, so consumers versus businesses, B2B, B2C. Uh, that doesn't work anymore today. Like it's all shifted. Um, and then when it comes to services, I mean, we were looking at obviously COVID, staffing shortages. I mean, good luck flying anywhere where you have a connection these days. Like it's, it's just going to go wrong. Um, and what's that going to do to people's appetite to travel? I mean, right now everybody's traveling because they got plenty of savings from COVID. They haven't spent anything going anywhere. Uh, but once they realize what kind of nightmare it is, like, is that going to impact it? We don't know, but we should look at that and integrate it into our campaigns. And again, the point is, these may not seem like your problem as PPC experts, but that is a big value add that you bring and, and understanding how you take these factors and uh, bring it into the PPC campaigns. And then this is an example about supply chain. So, I mean, we all heard that shipping container costs went up dramatically in COVID. So, uh, and what's interesting, what I didn't realize was that when it comes to shipping containers, they're not sold by weight. It's literally by volume. So shipping a container costs you now 20000 instead of $4,000. Um, and you can put one camera in that container and it costs the same as stacking that container full of really heavy things. Um, but why does that matter to PPC? Well, I mean, think about dishwashers, right? You have your low-end dishwasher, which is 400 pounds. You have your expensive one, which is 2,000 pounds. Um, they're the same size. You can put the same number in a container. And if you look at the, you can put about 160 of them in a container. And if that container costs $16,000 more, we're talking about $100 per dishwasher in extra cost. And now if you have your $400 one, that's 25% of the cost of the product versus the $2,000 one, which is only 5% of the cost. So guess what's gonna happen in terms of the supply? Well, you're gonna have more expensive dishwashers to sell because that's what makes sense to ship. Um, but then this is not your problem, shouldn't be your problem, but the business is gonna to come to you and say, well, we pay all this extra money on shipping, so the ROAS target that we have is gonna to have to shift. And the more that you can sort of be ahead of that and understand why this is happening and, and even advise, what are the limits of ROAS that you can play within is gonna help your businesses say, okay, well, maybe this is the product shift we need to go towards because that's what we can support you advertising online. Um, so I thought that was an interesting example. So another example to bring it really close to PPC, uh, pilots will input destinations into their autopilot. Uh, PPC pilots, they translate business goals into PPC targets. So uh, uh, one of the OGs in PPC, George Mitchie, um, his company was now acquired by Merkel, but he basically said, you don't put percentages in the bank. Um, and, and just to make the point that ROAS is always talked about as a goal, but it's, it's a really dumb goal. Okay, so, um, because people misunderstand it. And, and here's the question, if you can have a 500% ROAS or a 600% ROAS, which one will you choose? Well, I would say 600% because it's higher, right? Sounds better. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good for your business. And here's the problem. So if you draw a curve of your profit versus your T ROAS, the point you want to be at is the, the highest on the curve, which has the highest profit level. Um, but knowing what that T ROAS, that target ROAS should be to be at that point, is actually not easy to determine. Uh, and too many agencies or too many clients will just say, well, I want a higher ROAS. That kind of makes sense. But the problem is, by being more aggressive in terms of the profit you want to take, you're becoming less aggressive with the bid. So you go down in the auction rank and you miss conversions. Um, and because you have fewer conversions, even though they're more valuable conversions, you may actually cut into your profit, right? So that's the risk of setting the T ROAS too high. And on the flip side, if you set it too low, well, uh, you're going to get more conversions, but your profit per conversion goes down and you're again, missing out on a certain amount of profit. Now, the easy point is what is your break-even target ROAS? Uh, and that's easily calculated. So that's just your margin uh, or one divided by your margin. So the inverse of your margin. So if you have a 50% margin, you'd have a 200% target ROAS to break even. 
Now, the problem with that point is that's the zero profit point on the curve. So that's, uh, and that's why Google calls your bid strategy maximize revenue, right? It's not maximize profits, it's maximize revenue. But at the maximum revenue, your profit is probably going to be zero. Um, and so and then if you go too far down on the T row S, and obviously you start losing money. So that's the worst place to be in. Um, but how do you find that perfect row S? And I'll show you how to do this in Optimizer in just a minute. But uh, it's interesting because you can look at the budget simulator data from Google. And, uh, and so what I did was I copied this table uh, into a Google sheet so that I could calculate a few things. And specifically, Google will tell you, um, I think they, the, the row as I had to calculate, but then I calculated these three next columns. So I said, what is my incremental cost? And basically what I did is I take the current level of cost and I subtract the previous level of cost. And what's my incremental value? I do the same thing. I take my new estimated value and I subtract the last point of value. And then by dividing these two numbers, I can come up with my incremental return on ad spend. And now I can say something like, if I spend an additional $37, I'm gonna earn an additional $67. And dividing that means my incremental ROAS is 183%. Now, interestingly enough, my incremental ROAS is the same as my average ROAS. The average row as being the total cost and value divided by each other. So if I'm looking at this and I'm deciding should I spend $83 or 120, it's pretty much a no-brainer. I can spend more money, I'm still gonna get the same row as, it's great. But you go one level deeper, one row further onto that chart, um, my average row as is 131%. If my target row as was 120%, then yes, I should be investing that because my average is still better. But if I do the same incrementality, I spend 220 extra dollars for 230 extra dollars of return. It's still positive return, but it's only 104% incremental. So if my true, my true target was 120%, if that was a true boundary below which I start not making as much profit, then it would actually be a bad decision to buy that next tranche of spend, right? And so the, the point here is what you look at in Google is usually an average number. But everybody's focus is on incrementality. We should be incremental. Um, and that number you can calculate and actually figure out where you should be at. Okay, and so uh, that's kind of the insight then is if you use Google's flagship, state-of-the-art, best in breed bidding system, and you set the wrong target return on ad spend, it will give you zero dollars of profit. It'll maximize your revenue, but zero profit. And again, that might be exactly what you wanted, but in many cases, people haven't thought about that deeply enough, and certainly your clients haven't thought about that deeply enough. Um, and so they end up making bad business decisions. Exactly. And then we, we heard examples too, um, after we gave this presentation to people who said um, that they really segment their products, so they know certain products, they're gonna be repeat purchases after that, and then other things are just like this one-time purchase. Um, and so yeah, knowing lifetime value prediction by category or by product, um, and then, yeah, that means different T-Row assets. So that means different campaign structures. And that's where we then get into um, automation layering, right? Maintaining lots of campaigns with lots of different targets gets complicated, especially if that's based on business factors. Uh, and that's where Optimizer then has tools like these, uh, the smart shopping or the shopping campaign builder and refresher. Um, and is that something that you've used? Are you familiar with the no, not so far. Okay, so we can, we can show that afterwards. Um, but yeah, basically you can say, I want to build out my shopping campaigns. Um, and you can do it in simple ways, like say I want to have one campaign for each category of products and then divide those by subcategory and down to a product group level. Uh, but you can also say I want to make campaigns based on historical return on ad spend performance. Um, and so that, that's a dynamic structure, which as the ROAS starts changing, we regroup items into the right campaigns and, uh, and make sure that your business goals are really well aligned with the structures that you have in Google Ads so that you can run profitable campaigns. Please demo, but so if you wanted to start finding the best target return on ad spend, the, the rule engine that we have is actually really good for that. And so one of the nice things in the rule engine is you can set up custom date ranges. Um, which enables you to measure incrementality, right? And the, the problem is that too many people, when they do an analysis of, um, I changed my target return on ad spend, is my performance good? They look at sort of the totality of everything 
And, and so you get back to an average and so you're like, well, I lowered my T ROAS, my average performance is still good. But that's, if you remember on the chart, that was the 131% number, which is better than the 120% that you wanted, right? So you make the decision to continue moving your T ROAS. Uh, but thanks to Rule Engine, you can actually say, well, I'm gonna look at two different time periods. I'm gonna subtract those numbers from each other and measure the true incrementality. So when I changed my T ROAS, how many additional conversions did I drive? What was my change in cost? And based on that, I make my decision. Um, and so now the rule engine would notice, oh, it was only 104% incremental ROAS delivered. So then you would make a different decision <clears throat> than if you saw 131%. Um, and this is sort of a flow chart that illustrates how that would work. Um, so I wanted to go into rule engine here. Um, Jim, you've obviously used Rule Engine. Uh, Bart, have you used Rule Engine? You have? Okay. Have you used a different date range uh, capabilities? Okay, let me show it to you. Um, and we're redesigning the interface on this, by the way, so you'll see that relatively soon. It's a bit clunky right now. Um, but yeah, we have a couple of pre-built strategies for smart bidding campaigns. Um, so you can optimize target ROAS for ad groups running on smart bidding strategies. Um, and it's a funny thing, there's like 40 pre-built strategies all hiding within this tool. Yeah. Um, so this is a favorite. The other ones that I quite like are under search terms. We can detect um, new search queries. So in this day and age where everything's constantly changing, like you don't know what people are going to search for. So we have a report that says, find me queries that had some impressions in the last seven days, but we hadn't seen in the last 30 before that. Yeah, when everybody's looking for cancellations all of a sudden, you're like, oh, wow, that's uh, can't. Um, so anyway, this is a, a pre-built strategy. But what I wanted to show you right here, and sorry, the screen resolution is a bit weird. But under settings, you can put in date ranges. Um, and so most recipes will run or strategies run with a single date range. Uh, what's interesting here, too, is there, there is an offset. And this offset is really intended for your conversion lag to be accounted for, right? So if you make decisions, you don't want to make decisions before conversion lag is complete. So the conversion lag, well, I really meant 40 days ago until um, so, or, yeah, 37, until seven days ago. And then it shows you what that date range would actually be. Um, but you can also add custom date ranges. So I can say last seven days. And that's basically going to represent my last week, uh, but then I also want to know the 14 days before the seven days before that. And that's going to be 15 to 8. Right, so I can set up these date ranges. And once I'm done with that, whenever I click on any of these rules, when I'm here, I have these new date ranges available. Um, and so now you can start doing much more interesting stuff. Um, and so this is the left side, so I can say last seven days here. And then I can modify that. Okay, so uh, so that's one way in Rule Engine to manipulate t ROAS and sort of go hunting for what is the right level for your business. Um, anything else in Rule Engine that we should point out that's newer? Uh, we added some budget capabilities recently. Yeah, that's really show that. Uh, so budgets are a pretty big deal. I'm sure everyone's managing those. Um, and a lot of that has been done through scripts for us. Um, I'm going to create my own strategy. So the thing I want to operate on is budgets in this case. Did you just randomly put those on there? Or yes, on the yeah, absolutely <laughs> random. As we get added. <laughs> No, and this is actually a good page. The, the other one is more like some things are verbs, some of them are like sentences. I'm sure there's something on there that I can use. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we're redesigning that interface. Um, okay, so when it comes to budgets, so let's build one of the rules here. Um, so you could do stuff like if my uh, cost is less than a certain amount of my daily budget, um, you can also look at recommended daily budgets and you can start doing operations with all of this. And we also have, for example, budget pacing, what you're talking about, mm -hmm. so you know how you're pacing. Um, so the budget pacing, um, and Manas, is this live for 
Hall customers this preview of how many entities will match? No. No. Okay. We're doing it in a better way than you did. Yeah. Um, so yeah, one thing that's sometimes hard with these rules right now is you build conditions, but you don't realize it's not matching anything. So we're going to have better preview here that says you've already kind of excluded everything. So making another five conditions after that is not going to help you. Um, but yeah, anyway, and then so as far as the actions, um, so target monthly spend or modifications of the daily budget. Um, so this is based on the script. So you can say, I want to set a target monthly spend, and then you can do the distribution based on even daily distribution. Uh, my favorite is evenly with increases for high potential days of the week. Um, right. So basically what we're saying is if you have seven days left, and you have $70 or 70 pounds to spend in that, you would say that's uh, 70 divided by seven, so it's 10 pounds per day. Um, but till seven days, there's gonna be some weekend days and some weekdays, and weekend may be really slow for you. So holding back your budget when Saturday, Sunday, we just won't spend that $10, that's the wrong decision. So what we then do is we look at day of week distribution, and we look at a couple of weeks of data, and we say, oh, typically in your account, your Mondays will spend like, 50% uh, more than what a typical day would spend. And so what we're doing here is we're saying the minimum budget that we would set is $10 because 70 divided by seven, but we noticed Monday has higher potential, 50% higher. So we're actually gonna bump that up 50%. So now you're gonna spend $15 on Monday. So that budget is not being held back for Saturday, Sunday, when it can be spent. Uh, so some neat ways to do budget manipulation. All right, and then that's where then running the budget reallocation because what you would do then is you would say oh well monday didn't spend much so we have more to spend the next day and that works fine if those future days have high potential but if the last two days of your period are the weekdays then you know you're going to by that point say well we need to spend 20 dollars on saturday but it's just the volume is not there the people are not searching and so that's why these uh, predictive strategies work a little bit better all right so let's talk about the doctor uh, for a few minutes, so they really look at uh, prescribing treatments based on studies. So we, what we all want to show here is the RSA study that we did at Optimizer. So we looked at 1.7 million ads in our system. Um, so it's about $4 billion of ad spend uh, going through Optimizer. Uh, so we looked at a subset of that to look at what RSA behavior was like. Um, the one interesting thing is when we looked at impressions per ad group, there's more than double the impressions in ad groups that have RSAs in them. Um, we've run three iterations of this study. The previous iterations had sort of similar stats, but we'd looked at impressions per ad, um, right? And RSAs had significantly higher impressions than ETAs. Now we looked at this in the case of um, if you have a combination of ETAs, but there's also an RSA in the ad group uh, that's still shows you much higher volume. Now, nobody cares about impressions, obviously. We care about conversions. Um, so when we looked at that, we saw that it's still 1.6 times as many if you have RSAs added to the ad group. And kind of where that comes from is the CTR between RSAs and ETAs is pretty similar. Uh, no really measurable difference between them. And again, this was on 1.7 million ads, um, which was pretty amazing that CTR had normalized. Uh, in the two previous versions of the study, the CTR was significantly better for RSAs, but that's no longer the case. Uh, what did hold is that the conversion rate is actually worse for RSAs by about 11%. Um, and so then the question is always, well, if conversion rate is worse and you don't get more clicks, then why does Google want us to do RSAs? Well, the thing is, um, you need to look at the impressions, right? So that doubling of impressions, that is a pretty big factor. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, but so kind of as a knee-jerk reaction, some advertisers are then saying, I love ETAs, I want to keep ETAs, so we're going to make fake ETAs. And a fake ETA is simply an RSA where you pin one thing to every position. Um, we said, does that work? So we again took 1.7 million ads. We looked at those that were doing that behavior. So in this case, that was 93,000 ads. And of those 93,000 ads, with that behavior, um, where every position was spinning one thing, the, that's the, the yellow, the CTR was better than if there was no pinning, which is the blue, and the conversion rate was also better um, than the blue, which is no pinning. And that kind of made sense then when we thought about it, it's like, well, if you've been ad testing and A-B testing really well for 10 years, 
it makes sense that you've got pretty decent ads and the machine can't immediately improve on those. Um, but again, this is not looking at impression volume, so you are missing a significant number of impressions because the machine doesn't have the flexibility to show your ads in new auctions. So when it comes down to testing this and making decisions on is the ETA or the RSA the one we keep, the one thing we want to caution against is don't measure our RSAs versus ETAs on uh, traditional metrics, right? If you, it's not apples to apples in this case. Um, you can compare your RSAs to each other, you can compare your ETAs to each other, that's fine. Um, but then even when you measure them, kind of the old school way that we're all used to measuring is it's a combination of CTR and conversion rate. You multiply those two metrics, you get conversions per impression. Um, and the numbers here are based on the study, right? So the CTR is the same. The conversion rate is 10 to 11% worse. Um, so you multiply that out. That tells me my ETAs are the old school winner. ETAs perform better. Um, so again, and why is it that we like RSA so much? Well, because in the new way, you bring in your impression data. And again, based on the study, we find that there's roughly two times as many impressions on RSAs. And if you take the impressions and you multiply it by the lower conversions per impression, you get more incremental conversions. Now, assuming that you're doing automated bidding, then that would tell you that you're bidding the right price for these additional conversions. And this is actually a really good thing. So this is a modern day winning ad text. Um, and then as you're going through trying to figure out what is the right ad, um, just a word of caution. So ad strength is a closed loop recommendation system. It's not actually based on any metrics. Um, here's a person who was tweeting, and she had a study on the PPC Hero blog. But basically having a poor ad strength is just an indication of, compared to the average of everyone who's ever advertised, are you doing behaviors that seem good or bad? Um, that's a one-time judgment. And then you could have a bad prediction, but have amazing real-time performance. Google's not going to go back and change this determination. So um, I know I was in the quality score meetings where we had to decide how many levels do we show. Because at one point we had a little bar, which was, I think, like four levels. Um, yeah, believe me, these are fun discussions. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the guideline here is like ad strength, take it for what it is. It's just, uh, it's, it's not a great guide in any way. Uh, but then when it comes to ad testing, and, and this was um, new to me at, at some point. Um, so as part of ad experiments, Google now has ad variations, and these can operate on RSAs. And you can do cool stuff like uh, testing pinning. That's not quite obvious because you have to go to ad variations, and you have to say, I want to update my text, and then um, your headlines. And then on the third level of dropdown, it tells you you can test pinning. So there's no button that says, do you want to test pinning? You actually have to drill down into some other menus until you discover that pinning is something testable. Uh, but then you can see what happens if you pin or unpin certain things to certain positions. And what's kind of neat is that the, the metrics you see at the bottom here uh, are actually asset level details, right? So for the experiment versus the control, here's your conversion rate. Here's the number of impressions. Um, if you look at the asset reports in Google, they only tell you impressions. Don't tell you anything else. It's really hard to make decisions at the asset level, but thanks to ad variations, you actually get some of that data. Um, I'm kind of curious how you guys think about ad testing. So that there's kind of like run multiple RSAs with different themes to kind of thematically figure out what's better performing. But then once you have your themes figured out to do the uh, deeper analysis of would it be better to say, get 10% off or 10% discount, which is the same thing, but just different ways of saying it. That's where we think ad variations seem to work quite well. So I want to show you an optimizer. So, uh, sorry, what are you? So in optimizer, we've added the ad text optimization for RSA feature. So uh, you will find it under optimizations for ads, right there, ad text optimization. Um, but what we do is we grab your assets and we just put them on a page and we show you how often you're repeating that asset across different RSAs. So here, the, this for our ads optimizer, we use it in four instances. Um, it's kind of neat because we can just do a bulk edit from here. So we could change that to optimizer.com, save it. Um, 
right? So if something has the wrong year, for example, there's a quick way to, to make modifications. Now, uh, where this becomes even cooler is you can say whether something is spinned or performance grouping. So we can actually run a filter on here. Um, <clears throat> so add strength, and, and we don't have any data in our add strengths, but if you did, you could say, I just want to see the instances where uh, that asset belongs to an RSA where it's poor. And obviously the same phrase could sometimes be good, could sometimes be poor, depending on the ad group that it's in. And so this is a really cool way to say, find me the instances of that where Google doesn't love it, and then just change it in those instances, right? By running this filter here. Um, you can do the same thing for saying whether something is pinned. So optimizer, when it is pinned to position one, that's when I want to change it to optimizer.com, but otherwise maybe just leave it alone. Um, so these are the things you can do. And then also um, you can look for how many existing headlines you have in those RSAs, for how many descriptions you have, um, et cetera. Can you filter it by campaign or something? Yeah, so that was a request so that's right that? here, oh. uh, but the label thing wasn't possible yet. So that's one thing we're considering. I think you can do new criteria. No, you can. So you go select by. You can select by label or by strategy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can just work work, work mm -hmm. off of a certain type of campaign or campaign of certain. Did you know that this was where my mouse is? That this was the campaign picker. I mean, yeah, I just... Uh, okay. Just now. <laughs> no, no, but like, I, I'll be honest, to me this is not obvious. Yeah. But um, in all the tools, we're moving to... Yeah. This. Yeah. We're moving this? Okay. With the new criteria. Because this file to be like the logo of the tool. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any cool bulk capabilities on this? Yes, if you want to work on these in an Excel file, you can download it. Download so you can download it from here and then re-upload it right mm -hmm. there. Uh, there's also a bulk find and replace. So rather than going one by one, you could find every headline that contains the word optimizer and change it to something else. It also lets you add variations because you can also create. Right, but create new ads doesn't mean create new assets. It, may, it means new RSAs. Yeah, and that is a capability we are adding. Um, another very cool capability we are adding that you're limited to impressions in Google and here right now, but we believe we can add other metrics here. That should be the And you got back to us and they think they can do it? Yeah, and when somebody gives that feedback, I'm always like, tell your Google rep too, so Kirti. <laughs> one more vote on that one. Anyway, so that's uh, RSA capabilities. Uh, I mean, the migration is complete. We had some capabilities around that, but I think those are not super relevant anymore. Um, are RSAs in the rule engine? Yeah, you can actually get a, a you report. Can set up a report to get all your rules or um, excellent I don't know if they still have data, but... but yeah, so that's another RSA capability. Is there anything RSAs related that Either of you can think of that's like taking a lot of time in the agencies with the clients. Um, Jim, you did talk about images. Um, yeah. So in like performance max assets or dynamic search ads? Uh, in what? performance max. Okay. Um, what are you doing with those right now? Are you optimizing those at all or is it just more like sticking um, to the issue? Again, we're, we're trying to. I mean, we're. we're fairly late to the party as far as running performance max because mm -hmm. for me we've had smart shopping kind of dialed in quite well mm -hmm. you know we we've, we've had sort of discovery kind of doing okay youtube doing okay so for us like trying to just put it all into one didn't seem that like mm -hmm. that complicated and for, for us i thought i'd rather wait and sort of see how everything else played out because i know it was obviously beta and then it became sort of publicly available and what i've found historically whenever you run a beta, you always get good results. When it comes out of beta, you end up with not so good results, <laughs> right? Because everyone's got it now, right? Uh -huh. You're, you've lost your first mover advantage. Um, so yes, yeah, so I just wanted to see how things kind of progressed and evolved. But obviously, we're at the point now where we're, we're sort of running out of time before 
transitioning. So, yeah. so yeah, so I've got some clients where we're we're running performance max. Um, you know, and again, it's tr- trying to work out what what the strategy is, how how to kind of do structure the asset groups, what sort of listings to have. You know, again, just trying to sort of play around with with, with all of the various combinations. You know, again, we've got somewhere we we've, we've just gone straight shopping, nothing else. So you know, it's, all, it's almost like a performance max, but it's a smart shopping mm-hmm. campaign in, in in name other than that. Yeah. Um, you know, and then obviously from there, it's, it, there's there's others where we've tried to say, okay, well, let's try and sort of get some decent performance. But again, it's, it's we, we've just found with performance max, just generally, it's quite volatile. You know, so it takes a bit of time. I mean, I, again, I'd love it if it sort of started to perform really well right from the get go. But quite often it's like, you know, you're 10 days into it, you're like, should I leave it? Should I stop it? You know, it's kind of like you start panicking and then it starts to kind of tick in and, and eventually kind of gets to the point where it's over. Right, so it's kind of the learning period in the yeah. beginning. Yeah. You know, but it, but it is quite disconcerting. You know, we, you, you start something off with a, you know, a deliberately low budget because you're frightened of kind of spending a grand a day for two weeks just waiting to see what kind of comes out at the end. Mm-hmm. Right, so you start off with a much smaller budget, which isn't really sort of going to be good for the clients, probably not going to be good for Google. It's just, you know, yeah, yeah. For me, it's always been like that that challenge of, you know, trying to get things sort of dialed in at the right in the right way. Yeah, and then sometimes you just increase the budget later, and it starts to do completely different things that it was doing on low budget because yeah. now it feels that. You wanted to do different things rather than just more of the same. Yeah. yeah. And, and actually, I mean, again, it's sort of, it probably sounds a bit quirky, but we've identified that there are parameters that, that performance max campaigns pass. So, what we've done in Google Analytics is we split out performance max into its own sort of uh, channel in you know Google Analytics. So, we've now got performance max in addition to okay. you know, generic search, branded search. So we can actually sort of isolate that. We've also been able to kind of flag it and tag it in um, Lucky Orange because we use that as a sort of like our tool. So we, we can put a behavior tag. So we can actually isolate all of the performance max traffic and we can see all the performance max sales. Hmm. So we're not getting necessarily the data that we would want. But what we can see is we can obviously, if it's a shopping one, it's got the product ID parameter. Hmm. So we can see that it's a shopping ad. And obviously if there's no shopping ad, we know it's not, Shopping that kind of generated, so right. it's kind of like we, we we can make some assumptions based upon the limited data that we get outside of what we get in Google. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The the channel allocation uh, that's sort of, so the URL report will also tell you. You can sort of map it. Yeah, but not beyond shopping versus not but, shopping. But for me, I, I, again, it's like because of the delayed attribution or, or reporting, mm-hmm. it could be four days before we see any meaningful data. Right. Whereas in Lucky Orange, we see it in real time. Okay. All right. So, um, last section here. So, uh, the teacher, the PPC teacher. Um, how do you teach the machines, right? And so, the example that I wanted to give here was uh, the teacher rewards students who give the right answer. Um, in this case, the machine may not know what the right answer is. So, the job of the teacher is to help the machine with that. And so, if you're in lead gen, um, and the classic example here is VBB, right? So you may consider a quote unquote conversion in your business to be when somebody fills out the lead gen form on the landing page. Um, and then a lot of stuff happens after that. That may be things that you're not able to report for every client. So you may not have the capability to track the GCLID, to do the offline conversion import. And so the problem becomes that everybody's first to lead. Some people become people who ask for free estimates and then some of those free estimates lead to actual sales. Um, obviously, these have different values to the business, but if you're doing cost per acquisition bidding with no reporting of these deeper stages of the conversion, then everything gets the same bid, right? Everything gets a $10 bid. And you're bidding the same amount for the lead as the, uh, the person who actually becomes a customer. Now, um, the problem is, uh, or actually the, the solution is do value-based bidding. So you should in some way tell the machine that some of these uh, customer behaviors are more valuable than others. Right? We're putting a $300 value on the sale happening as opposed to $100 on just the lead happening. 
Because once you do that, now the machine says, ooh, well, somebody who's just a lead is not as valuable, so I'm gonna bid that, I'm gonna only bid $5. Someone who's actually becoming a customer, that's maybe worth paying $15 for. Now, um, the problem is, if you're not doing this, you're not just suffering from your lack of action on it, but you're also being sucked down a path where all the uh, more advanced advertisers are forcing you down the wrong path even further and further. Because the sophisticated advertisers, they all start bidding less and less for the person who's just a lead, for the junk lead basically. And you might be running on a maximized conversions type strategy. And the way to get the most conversions at the same cost is to buy the cheapest conversions, which happens to be the junk leads, right? So over time, you're gonna see more and more junk leads, whereas your competitors are gonna start seeing more and more of the leads that are high quality that tend to convert into customers. Um, and that's why it's so important, even in lead gen, to start thinking about reporting value of different types of conversions rather than just having a consistent value for everything. Um, now this is hard and uh, you know there may be some clients where you just can't get the Gclit thing working, where they don't have the CRM integration. So uh, luckily we have conversion value rules and this is a Google feature and I'll show you how to do it in Optimizer in just a minute. But the idea is very simply that you look at your business uh, parameters overall and, and so us as a software company, we get leads from India, the UK and the US. Uh, if I'm not tracking each of these leads individually with a GCLIT, I can still say that a, a, a trial signup that comes from India is not as likely to convert to a paying customer or as high of a paying customer as someone from the UK. And someone from the US is even more likely to become a really good customer. So what I can do is I can actually say, um, if a trial comes in, which we consider a conversion, and it comes from the UK, use a value rule to double the value. Um, if it's from the US, I want to triple the value. If it's from India, maybe I want to decrease the value. And so by doing that, I am helping the bid management system, automated bidding, to bid differently for these different types of customers. Um, so let me show you how you can do this in Optimizer. Okay, so you'll find this under Optimizations for Automated Bidding, Optimize Value Rules. Now there's two components to this tool. Um, generally, when you come to this, you won't have any data yet, so you'll be asked to go to the segment score. It'll be a big box that tells you to go there. But the segment scorer is asking you to make some uh, gut level, business level decisions about different segments. Okay, and so I'm gonna start with all segments. And so what we do is we pick up on what are commonly seen segments from your Google Analytics data about where your customers or your visits are coming from. And so, um, uh, this is totally random, but it's asking about London, UK, which is kind of cool. But so if I got a quote unquote conversion from London, UK, how good is that in, in my book, right? Do I like that? And uh, so we previously rated that at a four. So one would be the worst, four or five would be the best. So I'm happy with four, they're a little bit better than average. Um, they're not the best in the world. Bangkok, Thailand, not good. They generally don't have the budgets to pay for the software, even if they need it. Uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, same sort of problem. That's a one. So I'm going through this. I'm scoring these. As I'm done, uh, or by the way, so you can look at related scores. So you can see how other team members have scored it. And every team member... Uh, just relying on data, it's a, it's a feedback loop system. So now one, once a segment is performing badly, Chances are that it's going to perform worse later and, and because now we keep bidding lower and it just doesn't perform. So yeah. this is where you can create that too. And now Jim, like if you have a list of zip codes and cities for these mortgage brokers, um, you don't have to go through the scoring tool this way. What you can do is you can um, download it. Yeah, we'll start scoring. Oh yeah, it's not the usual yeah, download button. Bulk, yeah. A bit yeah, so you do the box score segment, so that's going to give you a download, and then you can re upload that. So that's going to give you the full list. You can map that to your business data, just put it in. The other thing that we notice sometimes here is the agency doesn't actually, it's not in a good position to make these cut decisions, uh, but you can take this box download, give it to your client, ask them to do it, and then you can also have multiple people do it. Um, and then we combine the scores. Also, we, we have a one to five in the tool itself, but I think you can put in decimal points through the 
um, the bulk system, right? So you have more grain. So again, to your point, why is it five levels? Yeah. If you want to use 15 decimal points, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we recommend you don't, for example, see your conversion rate data and just, just map it to a scale of one to yeah. That's not the intention because the system is already doing that. And if you want to, like we are doing it by... Um, yeah, the example is uh, geographies. But, but you can choose a different yeah. segment. Um, yeah, exactly. So here it was asking geographies. It can also, does it do audiences yet? Yeah. It does audiences and it does uh, yeah, devices. Devices, yeah. Demographics. That's part of audiences, I That's think. Um, we're actually thinking of doing day parting on this as well, which is not a Google capability, but we can add it. So uh, once you're done with the scoring, then you go to optimize value rules. So then we take the scoring that you've done and uh, we provide suggestions for how we would put conversion value rules into Google. So conversion value rules is a Google feature. You can go put it in manually, but it's a bit tedious. Here we said, well, based on the fact <clears throat> that you put uh, England, UK as a score of five, we recommend a 1.05% or 105% increase. You can change the aggressiveness, um, right? So it's a sliding scale of how much up and down we go in terms of making these decisions. Something like uh, the Dominican Republic is not a good market for us. So uh, actually it's, it's rated as average. So we'd leave it at no change. Bangkok, Thailand, we scored it as a one, so very poor. So there we would actually start bidding down for the conversions. And so what this is gonna do once you apply it to Google is again, teach the machine, we like this better than that. So try to get us more of this thing. And again, this is a great way if you don't have the GCLID data. If you have GCLID data, or if you do enhanced conversions for leads, then that's absolutely the more precise system to use. But uh, and if you don't have that, this is a great substitute. Yeah, exactly. And that's where enhanced conversions for leads, where you just capture the Gmail address and send that into Google in an encrypted format. It's just like a no brainer because that's already in the CRM. Yeah. Um, and then we should talk more, but we're also doing some CRM integration projects uh, and basically thinking about building a, a scoring framework that connects your CRM. And so basically you could come in and say, how important is the geography of the lead versus how important is the fact that they have a company size of a certain number? Yeah. Um, or that because, they have- Because again, I, I, like, I mean, I've primarily done e-commerce has been my main kind of client base, but mm -hmm. now I'm finding more, I'm getting a lot more leads for B2B, mm -hmm. right? And again, some of that, the complexity of that will be, you know, when it looks, when we're looking at things like lead capture, we're, we're asking people to one, use HubSpot because we're a HubSpot partner, mm -hmm. but two, that then gives us firmographic information because mm -hmm. what I want to be able to do is as we get a lead coming in, we want to be able to distribute it to the right, most appropriate person internally in that organization yeah. to ensure that they get the best outcome, right? What you don't want to have is a, you know, monster of a kind of client coming through and it's a brand new salesperson that gets the lead. I right? yeah. want to make sure that the lead gets funneled in the right way, yeah. uh, which is a lot more complicated than just, hey, a lead comes in, somebody fills in a form and it gets sent out. So we're asking people to not not accept Gmail addresses, Hotmail addresses, mm -hmm. you know, anything that's kind of like a, a free email account. We're basically saying, no, nah, it's got to be an optimizer.com email address or a spacemedia.com email address. Mm -hmm. So then that way, we can get the firmographic information. So we can see how many employees, how big the company is, yep. um, immediately rather than having to kind of wait until they actually fill in the form to kind of tell us that. Exactly, and then you get uh, firmographic data and then you got your three to six month conversion cycle, but now you can start making sort of predictions. So generally bigger companies, better outcomes for us. Yeah. So that's the thing we're gonna put into the system. and. Immediately when we get that lead, we're going to report back to Google that this was more valuable, even though we don't know it's going to convert, but we think it's going to convert. Yeah, because it, it's, that's always been the thing with um, you know some publishers fake conversions to make sure they get more mm -hmm. kind of AdSense traffic coming to them, right? Yeah. But you know, but it's the same thing. Like, so you can basically say this lead is worth more to me, even though it might not necessarily be worth more. Right. But it's almost like you're trying to educate the um, exactly the, the kind of the algorithm to kind of like. To, to say, yes, I want more of that and less of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because there's no clean way in Google to say, I want companies above 100 employees. Yeah. And then this is how you can actually do it and very easily. Yeah, so that's something we're building in Q3 that um, we'll just take a note to show it to Jim when we 
have something really on. Bart, is that of interest to you as well? Kind of like the lead gen space, CRM scoring. Um, all right, so then uh, enhanced conversions for leads. So I'm pretty excited about that from Google. Um, sure you're using that if you do lead gen. Uh, the final portion, and uh, this was HeroConf, so made some superhero references. But basically, how do we become PPC superheroes? Uh, two superheroes I like, Batman and Iron Man, they are great, partly because they have great assistants. Uh, they have Jarvis or Alfred. Um, and so who's your Alfred or Jarvis in PPC? And for us, it's actually also Alfred. Uh, it's automation layering. So what is automation layering? It's just really kind of going back and saying, listen, the best company in the world at machine learning is Google. Uh, because they have the most resources, the most people, the most money they can put towards it. So us, we're not going to beat Google at machine learning projects. Um, and kind of like what Jim is saying, right? Like just go all in. But we want to go all in, but with a layer of control. Like that's what we as advertisers, we crave control, we crave insight. And that's what automation layering can bring. So when it comes to something like controlling the structure, putting the right product in the right campaign, fully automated campaign, but the campaign with the right targets, the right conversion value tracking system, right? You can have conversion types down to the campaign level. So maybe you can have different conversions by campaign. So how do you put the right product in the right campaign? That can be fully automated. That's a simple rules-based. If the product has these five criteria, put it in this campaign. And if those criteria change tomorrow, then automatically put it in a different campaign. So that's where the... Uh, uh, the shopping campaign builder, the shopping campaign refresher come in and then it sends it into the right automation from Google and Google goes to town and does a great job. Uh, monitoring performance, right? So if any keyword cost per click goes above $100, which maybe is more than the average um, you know, profit of a product, then point it out to me. A $100 bid could have made sense in the, the scheme of my average performance is still great, but on an individual basis, that's kind of a dumb decision. So an automation layer can prevent that for you. It should raise overall performance. And that's something we see agencies already doing manually, but something we will be automating for you. And it's also that sometimes, very often different geographies actually do require different kinds of targets. But because everything is being averaged out, those, some, those geographies always seem like they're doing really badly but they probably have a better chance of performing if they were just not competing with the best. Exactly. Um, and they can also think about automation layering as a bit of PPC insurance. And I thought this was a funny image there, but a slide from IBM back in 1979. In a court case, IBM said a computer can never be held accountable. Therefore, a computer must never make a management decision. Uh, yet here we are in 2022 and computers make so many management decisions. Um, and it needs to be held accountable. And to hold that accountable, we just need automation layers. We need little controls and alerts and checks that tell us what the machine is doing. And if it's not doing the right thing, we can reel it back in, right? So we give it boundaries within which to operate. Some specific examples of automation layering. Uh, again, PPC Pilot creates a simple alert to be notified when the average CPC of a smart bidding campaign exceeds the cost of that product, the averages point. Uh, the PPC doctor could set up an audit to be notified if a team member, uh, you, you work at agencies, right? So there's other team members, maybe they make mistakes. Maybe they put a broad match keyword in a campaign that doesn't have automated bidding. Okay, so there, you have a $5 static bid and broad match is going to show your ad for all of these crazy things, which is completely fine if you're smart bidding because Google knows the conversion rate is going to be less, it's going to bid less for it. But with a manual bid, you're paying $5 for every crazy broad match variation. That's a bad thing, right? So now you know. Uh, and then the PPC teacher can say, oh, hey, well, we've got a big sale happening next weekend and Google's not going to immediately pick up on that. So we're going to set a seasonality bid adjustment or we're just going to manipulate the target return on ad spend to account for the fact that we know conversion rate's going to double. Um, we want to take full advantage of that great short term event that we have. So these are some examples. Um, so, I, mean, I can just add a basic thing like uh, the machine learning is as uh, intelligent as the data which goes into it, and this uh, layering is all about what you're feeding into the machine. Exactly. So, lots of us, lots of stuff for us to layer into it because that automation is going to continue to happen. But we think automation layering, more and more people are talking about it. It's, it's just a great concept of how to stay in control of the machine and ultimately 
provide value to your clients and have a reason to make money from your clients. Um, because people and automation together, um, it's been shown, they drive better results and we believe that's gonna continue. So um, that's it. And then I have copies of the book for everyone and uh, shown you a couple of optimizer examples. And that's where I end. But happy to do more Q&A or uh, go through optimizer.